Welcome back everyone to the Python tutorial seminar series. Today, Alea Kutz will be covering GeoCat Comp and highlight some of the functionality developed by the GeoCat team. Before we begin, I need to review our code of conduct. So by joining this Zoom call, you've agreed to adopt these values and engage in respectful communication only. Any inappropriate remarks or comments will have you removed from the call by one of our co-hosts. As always, the seminar is only an hour long. So uh, if we're not able to help you throughout the lecture, uh, please just uh, relax and we can get you up to speed uh, via email or office hours after the fact. Um, there will be some co-hosts available to answer some questions in the chat, but um, sometimes your problem might be more involved than that and we might need more one-on-one -on -one assistance. And here are some learning resources I would like to direct you to. We have a uh, Stack Overflow, as always, uh, the GeoCat Comp documentation. And today we also have the content posted on GitHub. And I will post that in the chat in a second. Uh, with that, I will hand the reins over to Alea. Hello, can everyone see my screen? Welcome to the GeoCat Comp tutorial. Um, community developed site geosciences in Python. I am Malia Kutz. I am a scientific software engineer too for GeoCat at NCAR. What is GeoCat? Um, GeoCat is a geosciences, geoscience community analysis toolkit. The team and project were born of the result of NCAR's pivot to Python initiative in 2019. GeoCat is an effort to recreate relevant tools and develop new tools with a similar community contribution model as NCL's original development. GeoCat is always up to date. Our continuous release model allows for quick rectification of reported bugs, fast availability of new tools once tested, and monthly adjustments to changes in packages we depend on. Um, GeoCat comp, which we're talking about today, is the computational component of GeoCat's functions um, specifically for operating on geosciences data, although they can be applied to other data types. Um, GeoCat has three goals. Um, first, to develop Python ecosystem packages, primarily for analysis and visualization of geosciences data, as per earlier. Uh, our second goal is open development. We do some of the development, but we all benefit from community contributions. We assist in making contributed tools meet our implementation and testing standards. So if you have a tool that you've developed in geos for the geoscience use cases, um, contact us or make a pull request for us and we will help you get that into the GeoCat toolkit. Um, our third goal is scalability. We build with compatibility for DASK, X-Array and other packages. And we do our best to ensure that our tools run just as well on laptops as they do on the supercomputers that NCAR runs. That's a quick overview. We'll get into more detail later um, during the Jupyter um, notebook. Um, but do you have any questions right now? Okay, if you are using the GitHub link that um, Julia has dropped into the chat, you'll arrive at this binder location if you click on the binder link. Otherwise, you're running the tutorial notebook from your Conda installation and you'll have something that looks like uh, what's here on my screen now. Um, for today, we will I will be talking about it from the binder link because that way anyone who's on Windows or Linux will have the same access that, uh, that I'm showing. Okay, Project Pythia, GeoCat Comp. Welcome. Um, who are and what is GeoCat? Uh, GeoCat is the Geoscience Community Analysis Toolkit. Note, it does not analyze the community, rather it is a community built set of analysis tools. Think of GeoCat as a machine shop instead of a production line. Lots of tools to modify or examine the data, but no predetermined outcome. You choose how to use which tools in which order. And hey, if you need another tool that isn't there, let us know and we will help you build it. Um, this is the Project Pithy presentation and we won't be able to cover every tool in GeoCat. So my goal today is to show some things that I think are interesting with the hope that you become part of the contributing community. Um, part one is data analysis tools. 
The next two sections will showcase a recently released signal processing tool set. Meteorological data are often noisy with overlapping signals of various strengths. And since I find Fourier analysis handy for fingerprinting data components, I wrote a superset of functionality from NCL into Python for abstracting away the process of decomposition, filtering, and recomposing the data. In the next few code blocks, we'll show you how to extract specific signals from meteorological data. Um, the focus of this is we don't really have time in a single hour to give an overview of all of the tools in GeoCAT. So I'll be presenting a couple of case studies in great depth. Um, we are likely to have additional tutorials on GeoCAT tools. Please send us suggestions for tools you would like to see us uh, present. Um, today we'll be covering a Fourier filtering tool, which we recently added to GeoCAT's tool set. And if we have time at the end, we will also cover a linear regridding tool, which is one of the first tools we developed for GeoCAT. Um, I'm now going to show the documentation page for the tool we're going to use, and then show you like an overview of the rest of the documentation, should you become interested and want to read up more on that later. Um, so if you, you can click the link in the notebook, which will take you where we're going, or you can just look at my screen. Um, zoom in a little bit. So GeoCAT has well, quite a few tools available, and they're in several kind of major sections. Um, primarily, we have like climatologies in the climatologies package, and those do things like calendar averages or calculate climatology anomalies and do various like large scale long term time based averaging. Um, the next one we have are like crop specific, like we're talking food crop specific functions that help with figuring out how well plants are doing given certain climate factors. Um, we have Empirical orthogonal functions or EO funks, um, which I think are mostly imported and wrapped. Um, they're quite, quite handy. Um, some people refer to them as eigenvalue eigenvector problems or principal component analysis or dimension reduction problems, but they all kind of fall under this, what are the principal axes of a multidimensional matrix kind of math. Um, today we're focusing on Fourier filters and those are looking at data, not in a, um, time series or spatial frequency kind of way, but looking at them actually in the, the frequency components of, of the data, which is a useful way of looking at things that are on spheres or that have cyclical components like yearly or seasonal components. We have meteorological functions that cover things like dew temps, um, relative humidity, and things like heat index that are like more human focused. And then we have like general math packages, like some polynomial math and skew t params. And then we have some computational routines that didn't really fit into those categories and also had Fortran backends that we haven't turned that faster Fortran math into other fast Python packages like NumPy that also do that kind of um, like liblast or liblapack accelerated math. So those are compiled using geo, um, M, excuse me, those are compiled using NumPy's f2py package and are kept in the GeoCAT f2py repository until we have time to figure out what their algorithm is doing, see if we can improve that algorithm for future use, and then implement them in, the pure, in a pure Python way so that we can bring them into GeoCAT comp. Um, today, we're going to be looking at the Fourier filter, um, which is the general case of the other Fourier filters, which just like are subsets of this functionality. Um, and it has a few parameters that will come in handy that we should talk about now so you know what the calls that we're going to do later are talking about. Um, the input parameters include the signal. That's like the raw data that we're going to pass in and do the filtering to. <clears throat> the frequency of the data set. So this tells um, the back end of this function where when we put in like a frequency that we want to cut off, it needs to know the frequency of the input data. So if our input data is say 100 units long and we're taking uh, one data point a minute, and we set a cutoff frequency in like, I want to cut off you know, between one cycle a minute and three cycles a minute. We know where that is in the output of the fast Fourier transform that it's doing. Um, so that's useful for the um, tools math. And then we have multiple frequencies, cutoff frequency low and cutoff frequency high. Um, those apply for low pass, high pass, band pass, and band block. Things like a low pass filter would only use the cutoff frequency low. Things like the high pass filter would only use the cutoff frequency high. And things like band pass and the band block would use both to define the band of either 
past uh, uh, the, the band of the frequencies that are allowed through the filter or the band of frequencies that are blocked by the filter. Um, that returns a return signal. The return signal is in the time or spatial domain, same as the original function, but it has already had the filter applied. I, it has had the Fourier components blocked in a certain band or passed in a certain band. And the return signal can be plotted directly against your original data. And we'll be doing that later today. All right, going back to the Jupyter Notebook. The first thing we're gonna do is pull pretty much straight from GeoCAD examples with some improvements to the plotting. Um, and it's a demonstration of a case in which a narrow high amplitude signal can be removed from a data set to see contributions from lower amplitude data. Um, this is tidal data from Point Reyes, California during the month of January of 2020. Um, so let's start running our various cells. Um, you can all run this first cell to import NumPy and pandas and matplotlib and X-Array um, and GeoCat Viz Util, which we're not using in this example, we'll use later, and GeoCat Data Files, which is where we're getting our data files, and GeoCat Comp, which is what we're talking about today. Um, this second cell here, we are pulling the data set from GeoCat Data Files. GeoCat Data Files is a, I was going to say small repository, it's an uncomplicated repository that holds um, a fairly large volume of data, not on your computer, but on a remote system. And it allows you to access specific files for use in GeoCAD examples or for testing your own routines without necessarily having to download the file first. It kind of does it as part of the math. Um, and we find it very useful, especially for an educational point of view. Um, so we're gonna run that cell now and get that um, data file brought in. Um, so we're saving out our height, our title height data in XR data. Um, and then we're going to use the Fourier filter multiple times all at once, and then we'll go through and discuss what we've done. So the first thing we kind of do is we define our data frequency. Now we know from our data set, we pulled this straight from NOAA, and they're sampling at 10 points per hour or once every six minutes. Um, so that's our data frequency, how frequent our data is taken. Um, and then we have to calculate, you know, what do we want to pass or not pass in our title, title data set? And there's really only two major components to tides, and that's the lunar semi-diurnal and the lunar diurnal tides. Um, so we're going to extract those two tidal frequencies from our data set, um, and we're going to use band blocks, and we'll talk about that in a sec. So we calculate the lunar semi-diurnal constant, which is once every half a day, semi-diurnal, and the lunar diurnal data set um, frequency, which is every day, or you know, two times half a day, roughly. Um, and that result gives us some frequency, um, which we define as tidal frequency one or two. We then calculate a resolution here on this line. And the resolution we don't use right away, but comes in handy when we're talking about where our Fourier, our fast Fourier transform, excuse me, where our fast Fourier transform has in terms of which frequencies it can accurately resolve given the way the fast Fourier transform algorithm works. And that's basically your data frequency divided by the length of your data. Um, the way I like to think about it is if you have any length of data set, the first available frequency in your Fourier transform is like the constant steady state, no cycles per, per unit length, per, per length of your data set. And then the first one is like one half of a cycle for your data set. Um, so your resolution is basically, you can see as low of a frequency as one half of the length of your data. Um, in terms of time or spatial dimensions or whatever. Um, now, given that it's like next, the, the Point Reyes, California is next to San Francisco Bay, there's going to be some like tidal echoes. We also kind of want to capture the solar diurnal and the solar um, semi-diurnal uh, tides as well, because the, the sun makes tides happen also. So we're going to create a bandwidth, right? We're gonna add or subtract from our tidal frequencies to create our cutoff frequency low and our cutoff frequency high for both our semi-diurnal and diurnal tidal um, frequencies. And we'll pass those into band, band block filters. Um, so we're gonna do some figure preparation. We are going to create a data set uh, by copying our XR data um, so that we can extract the tidal frequencies one by one from our XR data without modifying our original data sets. We can look at it later. And then we're going to plot um, at first a subset, just the center section of our, of our data. 
Um, we haven't modified a no title data yet on this line. Uh, we do that coming up. So this plot right here, which we're adding, which will be the blue line on the plot that will come up, is the data with no filters applied to it. Um, and then we're going to extract the first of our two frequencies. We're going to extract the semi-diurnal frequency. And as you can see, we're passing in our semi-diurnal frequencies low cutoff filter and our high cutoff filter. And we're defining the band block to be true, which means we are going to block only those frequencies from our data. Um, we do the same thing with our diurnal frequency here at CF low two and CF high two. We also are doing a band block and we are plotting both of those um, at the same section of data from our unblocked data. And if we run that cell, we can see that we get um, a frequency resolution of a certain number and this plot. Um, this plot shows our, in the blue line, our raw data. In our orange line, our data with the higher frequency component removed. And you can see that we do have one tidal frequency on this orange line basically every 24 hours, which is what we would expect, uh, 24.8 hours roughly for, for a regular tide. And then in the green line, we've only extracted those two tidal frequencies and we're left with things that show, you know, a little bit of noise from the extra wavy day or whatever, or we see things like changes in the onshore wind, which does build up water against the shore, changing the effective height of the water during the tide or against the low tide. Um, but what does that mean math wise and what is it actually doing to our data? So, here in the next figure, what we're going to show is the fast Fourier transform, like the midpoint of the calculation um, of the data. So if we look here, we'll just plot it right away and talk about the plots rather than how they were made. We are seeing the frequency decomposition of our initial data and of our data with those filters applied. Now the fast Fourier transform um, pulls out from temporal, temporal data it pulls out the frequency data and the signal amplitude. Um, and so what we see here is we see in terms of cycles per hour, we see that we have a semi-diurnal and the diurnal component of our tidal forces. And if you look at the orange line, how it's like flat where all of the big blue spikes are, that's because we are setting those frequencies to zero in the filter because it's a band blocking filter. Um, and so that's, that's, the difference. that's the only difference between two data sets is that we are setting these specific frequency bands to zero and all other components of those of our data remain the same. Um, and if we wanna look at the whole figure for the whole month, rather than just that, like that punch in, we can see here that we have, we can actually see, if you look at like the right third of the, of the chart, you can actually see a change in onshore wind due to a storm in January where because the onshore wind decreased for a little bit and then increased a bit more than it usually is, we actually saw changes in sea surface height at that point raised location, uh, point raised observatory for tidal data, despite the fact that like that would have com been completely buried in the noise of the tidal data had we not extracted those frequency components. Okay, another example would be extracting sea surface temperature from the San Francisco Bay also from a NetCDF file. In this example, we're going to try to remove the solar heating yearly cycle from a year of raw hourly data. We can speculate on other base surface temperature affecting cycles like the lunar cycle or tidal cycles, but until we've removed the really high amplitude seasonal components, we won't be able to clearly show them on a chart, um, the, the tidal or lunar month contributions to flow in and out of the bay. And I personally expect to have some visible effect of surface temperature from those. And I'm gonna try and see if we can extract the right frequencies in the right way. Um, again, so we're going to Im import a new data set. And this one is the SFBay 2020 metrology.nc file. It's a NetCDF4 file. Um, we're going to extract in terms of data and the time two, our water temperature in degrees Celsius and our time in GMT. And then here, if you look closely, we are dealing with real data. So we expect to have some missing values. There is no system with 100% uptime that collects scientific data. So we would assume that we have missing values in our data set. Now, 
just looking at our data, we expect those missing values to be located as like ASCII dashes. And so we're just going to replace all of the ASCII dashes in our data set with np.nan or the numpy nan. And then we are going to cast the rest of the data, which are also in strings, ASCII strings representing floating point numbers as floating point numbers directly. Once we've done that, we can index by nans, print the dimension zero of that, of that coordinate system and see, do we actually have missing data? Because if we have missing data, we cannot do a fast Fourier transform. And we did, we have two missing values. We have a missing value at 1381 and the missing value at 5705. Um, they're non-contiguous, which means we can kind of, excuse me, they are non-contiguous, which means we can, if we need to get rid of them, we don't have to guess at where they're at. We can just linearly interpolate between two adjacent hours of data and that won't contribute any real noise to our output results. So that's what we're gonna do in this next cell. Um, we're simply saying, in a naive kind of way, we're gonna go through our data set, O of N, and if we find something that has a missing value, we're just going to take the index of the value ahead of it, index of the value after it, and average the two resulting values, and that's our result. It correctly finds that those are the two missing values, it replaces them, and we can plot the figure of our, sea, our raw sea surface temperature, um, of the San Francisco Bay, this, this meteorological station is directly under the Golden Gate Bridge, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, and we can see this like kind of off-center semi-sinusoid of um, sea surface temperature between about 12 to 18 degrees Celsius. Um, so what is the underlying information upon which the Fourier filters that we're going to apply act? Um, Fourier decomposition, we've been talking about Fourier filters and I haven't really gotten about the math, so here we go. Um, Fourier decomposition is a transform from time series data to frequency series data. This is done either in the general case with a discrete Fourier transform, which has arbitrary frequency resolution. And if you have irregularly spaced data, you can do really cool things like look at very high frequency components. Um, but if your data are regularly spaced, it's not really the best choice. Um, and the discrete forest Fourier transform is computationally expensive at O of n squared in the best case, or you can look at your data using a fast Fourier transform, um, which works only on data with a uniform sample rate and has a frequency resolution that is static of the sample rate you have divided by your number of samples. But the fast Fourier transform, I mean, it has a name, word fast in the name, has the advantage of being comparatively computationally inexpensive at merely O of n log n, which is basically um, a, tree kind, a tree algorithm kind of complexity. Um, once the data are represented in a frequency series, we can set the amplitude of frequencies we want to remove from our data to zero. This is the Fourier filter part of the filter. And this effect, this is in effect a boxcar filter if you've done signal analysis before, and which if we get deep into the math could create high temporal or spatial frequency ringing if the discontinuity next to our removed frequencies is large. So we probably should look at our frequencies before we remove them to make sure we don't create any kind of discontinuity. Um, and that's what we're gonna do. We, we will check this against our FFT before moving frequencies. So we're gonna generate a frequency here, which shows our fast Fourier transform decomposition of our raw data. Um, and we can see that we have a very strong semi-yearly cycle that is one half of a cycle for a year, or one cycle for a year, excuse me, um, and a moderately strong bi-yearly cycle and almost zero, but not quite, um, like a third of a year cycle. So if we set all of these to zero, when we go back out to four cycles a year, we probably should be pretty close to not having a discontinuity. So that's what we're gonna do. We're going to look at what happens if we remove just the first three frequencies from this data set? Um, so for our data manipulation, we do want to detrend the data, but we aren't sure what trends are in the data set. We've looked at the FFT, but we haven't like plotted it yet. Um, and we don't want to remove something interesting. So we will plot the frequencies we intend to remove against our data set before modifying our data. Um, so again, we have our data frequencies. We calculate our resolution. Um, we set some arbitrary cutoff frequencies. And in this case, we're using the resolution of our fast Fourier transform to inform which frequencies we're removing. Now, frequency zero is the steady state component. So we expect that to be, that's where raw data say, kind of around 15 degrees Celsius. 
Um, so we'll drop that down to zero basically. And then we are going to remove frequencies one, two, and three. The high cutoff resolution when you're looking at a band, a band block filter at least, is exclusive, i.e. anything for and above is still allowed. We aren't doing an inclusive band block filter. And this comes back to like personal preference in the way I was designing the function. And if you disagree with that, please send me angry emails. I will listen to them and I will grade them. Um, so we're going to plot the blocked frequencies against our raw data set here to compare what we have versus what we want to remove. Um, again, our blue line is our first data set. And our orange line is the frequencies of one through three that we want to remove. And we can see that it actually would do a pretty good job of detraining the data. Um, at very few points is the orange trend line outside of our blue data. And um, it looks like it tracks the data well. There's no like discontinuities at the edge very badly. It tracks the, the meat of the function in the middle. So I think that's a good way to go. Um, so we'll do that. And so here we will detrend that data. We actually apply the detrended filter to it, um, removing frequencies zero through three. And then just because I said, I expect to see a, a, like a monthly lunar contribution to tidal flow, I wanted to plot the, like the, the next set of frequencies as an orange line from like frequency four to frequency 13. So that we'd be sure to capture the month the like roughly 12 to 13 lunar, lunar month cycles per year um, in our data set. So we plot that too. And what we get is this end result graph here where we have our detrended data in blue, which is centered about zero and Celsius, which is exactly where we want it to be. And we can actually see if we count peaks, one, two-ish, three-ish, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12-ish, we have basically seen the lunar contributions to our sea surface temperature in the bay, which is exactly what we're trying to do with this kind of Fourier frequency filtering tool, which will allow people to accurately model you know, geosciences data sets. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second and ask if there's any questions about what we've gone over. We kind of ran through a bunch of math and plotting without really slowing down. So here's a quick break for questions. Feel free to drop them in the chat if you have any. All right, then moving on. Other functions in the GeoCat Comp Toolkit include regretting tools or data format tools. Now, one of the very first tools we built in GeoCat Comp ever was from GeoCat F2Pi and was called Linint2. Um, and Linint2 or Linear Interpolation Two Dimensional. And yes, I agree the name could be better. This was the first function I brought over from NCL. And I kept the name. We might well rename it and have a transparent wrapper with the old name for backwards compatibility. Uh, once we've, but only once we've brought it into pure Python, rather than compiling the underlying Fortran into Python using NumPy's f to pi compiler. Also, the Fourier function, sorry, also the Fortran function runs at O of n log n, and I'm pretty sure we can run it in O of n if we use a modern implementation of linear interpolation. Uh, but that will require some creative indexing to make sure that we can always know where our four nearest points are in a 2D array. Um, all right, so we're gonna run our imports for this. We are importing Cartify, which we weren't importing before. We have had a project with the tutorial on. We will import matplotlib, numpy, x-array, Cartify, geoaxes. Um, this is for helping plot like actual geospatial data. We're importing matplotlib, um, well, from that plot that we're importing CM, and we're importing some toolkits, GeoCat data files, some GeoCat visualization utilities, and GeoCat comp to import the function linked to. Um, again, we're using GeoCat data files to get our data set. Um, we're pulling in a um, sea surface temperature data file that covers the entire, well, most of the globe. It covers all of our longitude lines, but it only covers our latitude lines from minus 60 to 60. So we have 
the 30 degrees of the poles missing, um, I'm assuming the satellite that took the data simply didn't have a good view of the polar regions. Um, part of Linux 2 is the regridding. So we have to create a new grid for our data. Now, our input data, if we look at our data shape, we have a um, 64 latitude points and 180 longitude points, which is fine. But if we're going to plot it and try to save some space, we can reduce that to whatever we want to do. And I think I was going, I'm reducing it from um, 64 latitude points to 60, and I want to reduce the longitude points from 181 down to 60 as well. You don't have to do it this way, like there's lots of different ways of doing this, but I needed to pick some numbers and I went with a square grid, because why not? Um, so we make a linear space between the max and mins of our original data, and we put 60 points in between them. And then we invoke the lineage to function to create our new data set, um, that will have that linear interpolation applied to it. Actually, I'm going to add in just to print this out. There we go. And so we can see that we now have 60 latitude points and 60 longitude points in the same format and with all of the same attributes from our X-ray data set. Yes, I told you all the functions work with X-ray just fine. Um, we have some missing values. Those missing values come from regions that are over a continent. And as we all know, a continent is not an ocean. <laughs> so we're going to skip the, those points, um, but that shouldn't affect our plotting. Uh, we're going to make a figure, and we're going to project using the plate carré or the equal rectangular projection. Um, we're going to create our axes. We're going to create our axis grid and do some all kinds of interesting things. And basically, this is all plotting right here. So we're just going to run the plot, and we'll talk about it. Um, if you look closely at our original grid, which has roughly uh, three times the data resolution as our output grid, which is we gridded to a coarser data set, which can be useful if you're comparing large data sets and you want to save yourself some compu computational time and you're not looking at very high spatial frequency data, or if you're doing like large climatologies where you're mostly interested in like, you know, is the polar or, or um, temperate regions, you know, more or less hot comparative to the tropical regions where you're like looking at more coarsely spaced um, groups of things. So um, after the regridding, we have a map and you can see all the data sets are still the same there. I have, you know, temperature is from zero, um, what was it, 25 to 30 or something? Um, or minus 25 to minus 30 to 30? Anyway. Um, all of our data are the same. We haven't really lost any peaks or valleys, but we have simplified the plot. And this is very useful for you working with larger data sets um, or comparing between data sets. If you have data sets that have different grids and you want to compare them directly, you can cast one data set to your other data set. We'd suggest casting your um, higher resolution data set to the same resolution as your lower resolution data set to do a direct point by point comparison rather than not being able to directly compare your values. And that is the end of what I had prepared. We got through it faster than my practices because I had fewer asides, but um, open for questions. Um, please ask anything you have. Okay, if there's uh, no more questions, then, um, oh, we have one question from Rebecca. Uh, can you please remind me what the dot chunk option does? The dot chunk option is a DASC command. It can be applied to X-ray data sets that have um, a DASC array in the location of the data, which I think most of ours do, especially if they're brought in from a NetCDF4 file. What that does is it allows it to um, chunk the data 
according to the dimension that is applied here. Um, so this data set is being chunked from a, a four-dimensional data set down to a two-dimensional data set, I believe because our Linux 2 interpolator requires a 2D data set to be put in. Now you can send in a multidimensional data set and it will chunk it and send it, oh, it will chunk it appropriately and send it back. Um, but we're pre-chunking it, I think, because we are only interested in seeing the chunk at zero, zero, rather than the last two dimensions. We're looking at one slice of this four-dimensional data set, although we could easily do the math to all four of them, all four of dimensions at once by passing it into the function. We're only plotting one slice, so we are extracting that slice by calling four zero zero uh, latitude longitude. Please give us that chunk. Are there any best practices or gotchas when interpolating data in time? Um, yes and no. One of the biggest problems with interpolating data in a time series is that you don't actually know what you're interpolating across. Um, if you are willing to do a discrete Fourier transform and ignore the contributions of your NANDs, you can basically get rid of those problems and, and rebuild your data set with those missing points interpolated at the highest possible resolution based off of the best available data. But if you're going to use a fast Fourier transform, you cannot ignore any data point because of the way the algorithm works via divide and conquer. So if you're using a fast Fourier transform and you have to interpolate data that's missing in a time series, the best option I have for you is to do a linear interpolation. Um, because if you, you can also do things like, you know, by cubic or something like that, where you have a cubic interpolation or a fourth dimensional interpolation and like use the four data points of either side and basically do a mini FFT of the things around it and figure out where the middle point would be if it was a smooth curve. But the computational complexity of that is not worth the few data points that will be added because they are literally, um, we had two missing data points in our um, title data set. And our title data, title data set was, I think 8,000, yes, 8,784 pieces of data long. So those two missing points contributed to like not 0.001% of our total data length. So it wasn't really worth, they're not creating noise, but just guessing. And a linear interpolation is just a really good guess that keeps it from causing high frequency contributions to our data. So, Suhail, um, it depends on the function. If you're talking about the linint2 function, which is O of n log n, but could be sped up, it's probably not too slow to matter. Like it's, it's fast. When you start talking about like Fourier transforms, those get a lot slower because of the n squared component. Oh, sorry. Um, in terms of computational time, how fast is it with dealing with a large data set, say more than two gigabytes? Um, that really, any kind of question like that really strongly depends on the big O notation. Um, there's a reason that the constant times whatever is ignored from big O notation because at a certain scale, the amount of time it takes to run the function is irrelevant compared to the increase in time when you increase the number of data points. For example, if I have a function that takes a whole second to run on one piece, on one bit of data, right? So let's say I have a data set with complexity and a function of complexity O of n, and it takes one second to do something with one data point, and two seconds to do something with two data points, and three seconds to do something with three data points. Well, that grows, you know, linearly with the number of data points. But if I have something that takes like 0 0.001 seconds, but has computational complexity of O of n squared, we're talking about like pretty soon, even if it takes, if it's really fast, like one one thousandth of a second for one data point, the moment you have like a thousand data points, you're looking at like a thousand seconds and you've matched O of n complexity. And then when you get to a million data points, you are at like 
a trillion seconds, which is well past the million seconds of your O of N complexity. Um, so speed is most visible when you're looking at the scaling between say, running and timing your function against a data set of size, let's call it size 100. And then you run your data set again against a data set that's 10 times larger. And that O of N scaling is always the dominant factor when determining computational time. So if you're optimizing a function, it is way better to optimize for a lower O of N complexity than it is to optimize for an individual run times speed. Does that make, does that answer your question or did I miss the point of what you were asking? And we still have time. So if people are interested and not asking questions, I can bring up a bit of the discrete Fourier transform math I've been working on in efforts towards a spherical harmonics routine. But I would rather answer questions first rather than just monologue. I also don't feel the need to fill the whole hour other than for the fact that we scheduled an hour. And I ran through this a little bit faster than I was expecting. Okay. In that case, if there are no further questions in the next 60 seconds or so, we'll just end the recording. Okay, I can, I can show the DFT math. Um, uh, Julie, you can kill the recording for this since this won't be part of the tutorial online. And I will bring up Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I will end the recording now. If you're uh, joining us on YouTube, uh, we look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. And if you're here live, feel free to stick around.